I'm talking to Richard Robinson from the Brighton Science Festival. Welcome, Richard. Hi. You're not a scientist, are you? So why have you developed this beautiful festival for the Brighton Science Festival? Well, I'm sorry not to be a scientist, but I can call myself, I think, a natural philosopher, okay. which is some ways better because I allow the scientists to do all the work, all the research, all the hard graft, and then I take their results and fiddle about with them in interesting ways because I can go cross curricula, which the scientist isn't allowed to do. <laughs> so did you, were you inspired in science from a young child? I mean, this is, uh... Yeah, my father was an engineer, an electronic engineer, and did uh, heroic works during the war, but I was the fourth, the youngest in the family, so the one thing I was never going to do is follow my father's footsteps. Uh, and so I became a, uh, a writer, and a busker, and a street entertainer, and a puppeteer, and anything else but science. But then one day I was uh, working on an eye mechanism for a puppet, uh, fiddling about trying to get it to fit in, and I realised uh, that I was doing engineering. So my father had come to haunt me. Ah, uh, is that because it stopped working and you had to mend it? Or? No, just the whole process of making a puppet is basically dealing with materials that have to do a certain job effectively, even if that job is to look human, it's the same sort of problem. So it's engineering. <laughs> so, and then about 10 years ago, you had this idea that, that Brighton needed this festival. You're living here in Brighton, of course. Yeah. But why set up this, this fabulous well, it's interesting. I, uh, there was a development after the, um, the puppet experience which right. was that I had children right. uh, and the children had to be educated and they had to have a bit of science. So I took them up to the Science Museum in London uh, and I noticed there something very interesting. They had wonderful props right. and I thought as a busker I could do with those props. I'd really like to work with those. The patter was awful yeah. uh, but the props were great. So I thought if I busked in front of uh, school audiences there was a steady sort of income to be had there, wasn't there? Yeah. As a natural philosopher I, I did it. Uh, and for a while it was great because dancing around in front of primary school kids is, uh, is terrific fun. They all adore you and they think you're wonderful and a bit magical. Yep. And then I discovered Key Stage 3. Right. 12 to 14 year olds, science dies almost as soon as they get to school. I mean, is that because of the drive to taking exams and being tested and all There's that? There's a of lot of that, yes. The, the final result of their experience at school is going to be them at a table on their own with the paper there doing that nobody looking at their work or them look, not looking at anybody else's. Uh, and that, of course, drives against anything that's scientific. Science has to be to do with experiments, has to be to do with getting things wrong. Yep. They're not allowed to get things wrong, they're only told how to get things right. It has to be to do with teamwork. You can't mark a team. Mm -hmm. So science exams are to do with individuals, whereas teamwork is to do with science. So teamwork uh, uh, and experimentation and fiddling about, they were out of the agenda, which was a big problem. All you were left with is the complicated words and formulae. So you thought, right, Brighton needs a festival. Yeah. But Galvanise and stimulate these yes. kids. The first thing to do was to get the Key Stage 3 kids animated. Uh, so we did a festival. And of course, to do that, you have to have the family fun days. So you get the, the parents and the kids coming in. Because the biggest thing about science is that kids will imitate the parents. Right. Science doesn't actually happen <coughs> right. at home. Parents happen at home, but no science. Parents don't actually happen at school. Right. <laughs> so you don't ever get science and parents in the same room, it right. seems. If there's a school play, people come, the parents will come. If there's a sports day, the parents will come. Science day, there's a tumbleweed blowing down the corridors. Oh. It's empty. So I, I thought, let's get the kids and the parents imitating each other, you know, getting to do science together, the kids watching the parents and imitating them. And you can do that better in a festival than in the classroom, for Absolutely. Example. Well, you can do it only in, in, the in, yeah. a, in a festival. You well, I know that you and I both do <coughs> the workshops for the Bright Science Festival, mm. when you invited me along, and for the last five years we've gone into schools, drumming up excitement about the festival in January, and then in February, March, the festival starts. Yep. And it's got bigger and bigger. It keeps on growing, um, partly, uh, well, mostly because um, uh, people keep on saying, let's do a bit of science. So I'm, I'm trying, every year I'm trying to do less, but people keep humming, coming along saying, I want to do a weekend on this or a day on that. Or I, uh, the people in art galleries saying, we're going to do science art. The uh, Hammer and Tongue, the local poetry group, uh, do a science uh, event especially for the festival. So that means that everything, just for that little while, has given a little bit of a science bias, a little bit of a science twist, which is great, because yeah, yeah. it means that people uh, encounter it in a safe environment. They're, and in lots of different ways. Yeah, and they don't have the complicated verbiage and the exams at the end, which is very important. They just have fun. <laughs> It's great. So is there one principle or idea or technique that's really inspired you that, that, that you think 
this has really helped me understand the universal science. I, I've had a guess. Every day is a new discovery because there's so much new science coming on. So I, I, literally, so I, can, I can believe six impossible things before breakfast, <laughs> and they t usually turn out to be true. <laughs> but one of the most amazing ones, I think, is, is chaos. <laughs> chaos has ruled my life and rules all our lives, and a lot of us try to get rid of it. But actually, chaos is at the root of all existence. Okay. That's a big one, isn't it? It is a big yeah, one, yeah. yes. The life on Earth happened because of chaos. And the revelation came to me one day when I was watching my, uh, my laundry. OK, I don't get a big budget, not being a scientist. I don't get to send immersibles down to the bottom of the oceans to have a look at it. I just watch the washing going round in the thing. And I noticed something interesting. Whenever the washing comes out of the drum, all the clothes have ended up inside the duvet cover. Why is that? You too, eh? Hey? Hmm. Hmm. It turns out that it's almost universal. Everybody finds this, and they think it's their own problem. They just <laughs> thought they bought a cheap washing machine or something. Well, not that cheap. Well, it makes a lot of noise anyway, and it's supposed to, and a lot of chaos to try and get everything apart. Instead of which, the chaos has shoved everything in. I've got it. Here's one I made earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Today's wash. And as you can see, there's the duvet cover, yep. and inside it we've got all the usual things. We've got one, two, three. I'm also interested in Murphy's Law, odd socks. Uh, and why, why, why does it happen? Well, it turns out that, um, without going into too much detail, chaos creates order, and you can do it many, many different ways. Here's a packet of muesli, right. and you can see the packet of muesli's got a lot of dust at the top there. Yep. Yep. All you have to do to order the muesli, so the dust goes down to the bottom, yep. and the big bits come up to the top, is shake it around. So shake you're it shaking it. it. You think, basically, you're putting a lot of random energy in there. You yep. don't think anything will happen. Yep. You think you'll get more disorder. Yep. Instead of which, the big bits float to the top, and, and the small bits, <coughs> the dust, falls down in between the gaps of the big bits, and therefore will end up at the bottom. So because of its natural uh, original state, <laughs> chaos produces the large bits at the top. That's magic. <laughs> that is magic. <laughs> kind of. But it's the same magic as created the universe, for goodness sakes. How come? Well, uh, <laughs> chaos cause is caused by forces that interact in some way or, or another. The yep. force of gravity and the force of me pushing around yep. makes that occur. Yep. Um, the force of the weather uh, the, the humidity and the, the temperatures and so on create the chaos of the clouds and the weather that we yeah, have yeah. um, and uh, that created the universe as well. Yep. Uh, and an example of this yes. is water going down a plug hole. Okay, right. Because all around the world, when water goes down the plug hole, it goes down the same way. Right. And one of the great characteristics of chaos is yes. self-similarity. Okay. Uh, so we've got water going down a plug hole there. Yeah, there's yep. water going down a plug hole about a foot across or so. And yep. you can see the swirls, the spiral that it forms as the force of gravity pulls it down <coughs> there is the the same the world over. Yes. And also those ripples around the outside, they all are similar, they're not exactly the same, but they have this wonderful similarity. Yes. Actually, I fooled you. Why? That isn't water going down a plug hole. It looks like it. No, it's bigger than that. It's not 12 inches across. It's actually 12,000 light years across <laughs> and is the spiral <laughs> galaxy. Wow. Uh, and exactly the same forces are happening there. You may not believe this is the spiral galaxy. I think maybe we should look at both of them together. I am uh, convinced now. now. I didn't. Th that, that is an inverse picture. So I just reversed the, the colours in there. Oh, so the dark there is the same as the light there. That galaxy there and that galaxy there and that one there and that one there. You can see it's actually the same old picture. Do this at home. <laughs> and so the same forces as create the biggest galaxies in the universe also create the smallest swirls. That's chaos. And it's everywhere and it created life on Earth. You and I were created through chaos. So Take yourself down to the bottom of the oceans where there are volcanoes erupting, where there's acids and pressure and heat and everything you wouldn't like to spend a holiday with. <laughs> Colliding together are all the atoms that form molecules that split apart. Another molecule that splits apart. It's happening all the time, chaotically. But there is one kind of molecule that occurs about four billion years ago, uh -huh. which splits apart, but not completely. It splits into two halves. Right. And those two halves reform themselves from the atoms that they find around in the zone. Uh, and there you have two identical molecules. That's life. Yes. In a little while, those two molecules split into four, then eight, then 16, then 32. And then through a number of steps, I'm cutting a long story short here, <laughs> through a number of steps, they create you and me. That's amazing. Richard, thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you. Um, details of the website are here, and there's a link to the end of the movie. And thank you very, very much. Thank you.